I'll start back in 1999, which I would say from about 1999 to about 2003 were some of the worst years of my life. How many of you have had periods of your life we can look back and you can say, oh yeah, that was, that was bad, praise God. That was, I didn't know I was going to make it or not, but God was good and he delivered me up out of that mess and shook the dust off of me when I was too weak to shake it off myself. 1999 to 2003, I was going through one of the greatest trials of my life. I've shared with you many times, so I'm going to give you the 30-second overview. My husband left. I had a two-year-old child, ended up in jail for a crime I didn't commit. I was released after 40 days, completely vindicated, lost everything I had, and I was just crying out to God. I was crying out to God for direction, for provision, for anything and everything that you would cry out to God for. And in that moment, I heard God say something audibly. It was the only time I've ever heard the audible voice of God. And he said this to me. He said, stay calm, be patient, your time is coming. And I really had no idea what that meant. I mean, I understand the words that were coming out of his mouth. I get it. Stay calm. Okay. Be patient. Yeah, I got you. Your time is coming. But I didn't understand the fullness of what he meant until 15 years later. Somebody say 15 years later. I would go through various trials because we all do. We all go through trials. And every time I would hit a low place, God would remind me of that phrase. Stay calm. Be patient. Your time is coming. And I would grow weary at times waiting on the promise in the face of intense warfare, but I held on to that promise and I kept on walking by faith. I would just encourage myself in the Lord because he said, your time is coming. And I, I, I would grow weary. Galatians 6 and 9 says, do not grow weary in well-doing because you will reap in due season if you do not faint. And due season, oddly enough, is kairos. There is a kairos time for your harvest. There is a kairos time for your breakthrough. The Bible says he will not let come, more come upon us than we can bear. I know that it feels that way sometimes. I know that I have felt sometimes like I cannot take any more pressure. God, this is just too much. Can anybody relate? Life is not easy, but God is good. The kairos time, the word for due season is kairos. There's a kairos time for you. What does that mean? It's a Greek word, and it means a fitting season, opportune time, occasion. It comes from the Greek, Greek word kara, referring to things coming to a head. Now, how many of you know there's a lot of people in the body of Christ right now? They're telling me things are coming to a head. They were below the surface. Nobody wanted to deal with it. I couldn't see it. Didn't know it was there. But all of a sudden, things are shaking. They're rumbling. Things are just moving and not in a good way. I don't know what's going on. Everything seems to be coming to a head. People are telling me it's coming to a head in my workplace. It's coming to a head in my family. It's coming to a head in my finances. Everything's just shifting. And I don't know what's going on. I'll tell you what's going on. There's a Kairos time that's about to emerge. You have to know that when all hell is breaking loose against you, when it's coming from every side, and it usually is with me, it's not just one devil. I can handle one devil. I can handle two or three or four. So the enemy, when he really wants to come, he comes with an onslaught. <laughs> And that's probably what he does to you too. Because mature Christians can deal with little fear demons. And mature Christians can deal with little financial attack. But when it comes every way at once, it's a little hard to keep standing and withstanding. He, can able, he is able to make us stand and we do stand. But we don't feel like we can make it. How many can you relate? This is real stuff. I'm going to get real with you today. It means, it means coming to a head to take full advantage of. Kairos is a suitable time. The right moment or a favorable moment. The Lord told me, stay calm, be patient. Your time is coming. And then 15 years later, 15 years, 15 years, David waited to take the kingship for 20 years. Abram waited for many, many years for his son, 
So it's not unusual for us to have to walk with the Lord for a long time before we see the promise. And many of us abort the promise before we ever get to the point of giving birth because we cannot wait because the warfare is too great. But God sent me today to tell you, you can make it. Whatever it is you're going through, however much pressure you're under, God sent me to tell you, you can make it. And God would say to you today, I am with you and I am strengthening you. Even now, I myself will lift up your arms and I will strengthen your legs and you will continue to walk forward says the Lord and you will even run toward the battle line again says God for I have put the victory in your hands if you'll just reach out and take it says the Lord amen we have to understand that sometimes things take longer than, than we want them to. But God is perfect and God has all wisdom and he will do what is right in the Kairos, in the right moment. So 15 years later, after God spoke these words to me, I'm in my house worshiping the Lord. This was in 2015. And the Lord said something to me. He said, this is your time. And in that moment, I knew that he was talking about the Kairos. I knew that he was referring back to that day when I was weak, broken, busted, and disgusted, crying out for every little thing I needed. And he said to me, stay calm, be patient, your time is coming. And I knew this is what he meant. This is my time. And I'll tell you what, beloved, ever since then, ever since 2015, doors have been flinging wide in every area. I became debt free. I began in traveling to the nations of the earth. I became editor of the first, uh, first female editor of the biggest Christian magazine. I mean, everything you could possibly imagine. It's like all the dreams that have been stored up for the last 15 years came to pass in an instant. You can't give up. And now I have new dreams and I'm in another waiting period, but that's all right. I know God is good. Turn to your neighbor and say, your time is coming. Yes, it's coming. You can't grow weary. I know it's hard, but you can do it. I'm walking in my Kairos time. There's a fitting season for you. By faith and patience, you inherit the promise of God. And the Bible says that your times are in his hand. I saw an Instagram meme yesterday, and it says, you know, you'll, you, 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 you get in an airplane, and you trust that the pilot has the skills to take you up and take you down, but you don't trust that God has the skills or the goodness or the grace to provide for your needs. Yeah. Every day we take all these risks getting in cars and all these things, and, you know, oh, God, help me. We've got to trust God. Tell your neighbor, you've got to trust God. It's not easy sometimes. If it was easy, everybody would do it. It's not easy sometimes. I get it. I believe right now the entire church, and I say the church, I mean the body of Christ is in a Kairos time. The entire church, the body of Christ is in a, I saw this back in 2015 when the Lord first started teaching me about the Kairos in a major way. I get to study it. And, and I knew then that we were entering a Kairos time. I could see it all around, but I know, let me give you a big picture and we're going to bring it down to a personal level. I want to give you the big picture, and then we're going to drill it down to how it affects you. We're seeing major shifts in ministries all over the world. IHOP has ended one thing. They're focusing now on family. Uh, Lou Engle ended the, set, the call and started the sin. There's ministries in Europe and different countries, and they're all making these major shifts of one kind or another. It's not all the same shift. They're making a shift but what it all revolves around is the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. I believe it's possible that we could see the return of the Lord in our generation. I believe it's possible. Will it happen? I don't know. But it's possible. The signs of the times are all around us. We're seeing major shifts in ministries all over the world. And now you can add my ministry to that shift. Jennifer LeClaire Ministries and by Trickle Down Awakening House of Prayer. This all started, actually it started a long time ago, uh, but it started, um, see I just returned from Singapore. And we were there for like, I don't know, a little over two weeks. If you add California, I think it was, I don't know, it was a long time. It was time enough for me to get completely acclimated to the time zone there. And just, you know, you know completely, we were there a long time in Asia. And, and I have never in my life, and I don't say this lightly, I have never in my life endured such an intense attack as the one that I endured in Singapore. 
I mean, it was coming against my body. My body was aching. I could not sleep at night. My stomach was, was messed up. But what was coming against my mind was so intense, so rapid fire, I could not cast down the imaginations fast enough before another one came and began to attack me. And I knew that it was an imagination. But I was being bombarded in my mind. Has that ever happened to any of you? Look at this. This is how the enemy works. The battle is in the mind. And I was getting hit in my body. And I was getting hit in my mind. And I was getting hit just about every way you could get hit. Financially, back home, every, all the money was drying up. I'm like, what is going on? It's a coordinated attack. And I said to myself a couple of times, I'm just going to go home. You have to understand what I was there doing was taping teachings on Jezebel that are going to the four-fifths of the world in like 16 different languages. And so I was being battered by these spirits. I was being battered by the enemy over a lot of different things. And I just had to stand and withstand and thank God people pray. Prophet Vanessa, in that moment, she said, she said, there's a shift coming. This is all about that. See, anytime there's a kairos that's in your horizon, the enemy will pull out all the stops to get you to stop short of your breakthrough. This is how he works. He knows. He's been watching the human race for thousands and thousands of years. He understands when we're close. He doesn't know everything, but he sees things. Sometimes he seems to know more about ourselves than we do. She says, there's a shift coming. I'm like, all right, well, I'm just going to keep standing. What are you going to do? You have no choice. And I kept fighting and I kept battling. And we went out to, to dinner um, with this uh, a friend, uh, the brother of a friend that we recently made in Singapore on the top of Marina Bay, which is like this mega mall with, it's like a really fancy place. And we went there with, uh, with a friend that we'd made and her brother and his whole family. And we're sitting there eating dinner. And this dude, his name is uh, Philip. This dude is telling all these stories of all these ministry exploits. And my jaw is dropping because I'm like, this is the real deal. This is the real gospel. This is the real campaign. Because in the American church, and forgive me, and I don't want this to sound the wrong way, but I know that you're mature and you can handle it. In the American church, it has for many ministries become about the next webinar and the next conference and the next whatever, the next social Facebook phenomenon, whatever. And we have largely, in many cases, left souls out of the equation. Do you know that evangelism is no longer a staple of most churches? Most churches don't have evangelism teams. The missions giving, if you look at the statistics in the body of Christ, missions giving from American churches is down. We were once the nation that sent out the most missionaries. And somehow we've lost sight of what's more important, what's most important. Listen, I am not against webinars. I am not against social media. I am not against uh, conferences. We do all that. But if we do that only and we don't remember what it's really all about, it's about souls. Jesus died for souls. Aren't you glad he paid the price for your soul? Hallelujah. Aren't you glad that somebody preached the gospel to you? Hallelujah. We were hell bound, but somebody cared enough to skip the big conference and to not do one more webinar and to hit the streets or hit the jail. That's where I got saved. We have to put the father's business first. All these other things are fine. They're good if they're in order. And this man, this billionaire, we were, he was driving us back to our hotel and he was on his way to the airport and, he sa and he's talking, and he's still talking. And when he stopped talking, I said, man of God, can, what advice would you give me? You have to understand, when you're around people of means, of intellect, of spirituality, you don't want to sit there and run your mouth. You want to receive everything that you can. And I knew who was before me and what he carried, the anointing and the business acumen. And I said, man of God, what advice would you give me? I did not know he was about to prophesy. He began to prophesy and I got out my phone and I taped it and he began to prophesy that you've been looking in some of the wrong places, he says. And he says that when you go to Indonesia, which is where we were going next, he said, everything's going to shift. 
And he began to prophesy. And I'm like, what are you talking about? And he said, you don't understand. He goes, you're going to preach at a mega church there. I said, yes, sir. He said, I called the pastor there and asked, can you come? And what you don't understand is it takes Marilyn Hickey and Shay on and Cindy Jacobs six months to get in there. They've scheduled these things way out in advance. But I called him and I told him who you were. And, and, I, and he said, yes, she can come on Sunday. He said, what? He said, that doesn't happen. He said, there is something there. God has ordained something for you there. It's a Kairos moment. It's a favorable time. And we went there to Indonesia, and that was pretty rough, too. The attack, actually, the attack broke when I was in the plane from Singapore to Indonesia. All that attack. It was about that Jezebel taping, mostly. So we get to Indonesia, and that was kind of rough, too. I went and preached in the first church. It was a smaller church. It was like unbelief. It was horrifying. God, you can't do anything in unbelief. We went to the, the church the next night. It was glorious. I re, it released a prophetic word for the nation, taught the intercessors how to war with the word. And they're all like, give me a copy. We're taking this. We're warring with it. And it was good. But what happened there was that God shifted my whole mindset to souls. And I'm still going to prophesy, and we're still going to have revival, and I'm still going to lay hands, and I'm still going to do webinars. But my purpose and my focus and everything that I do from now on is going to be unto getting people saved and discipled in the name of Jesus. Amen. We're still going to prophesy. We're still going to dance and sing. None of that changes. But everything is earmarked for the funding of the gospel. It's going to change some things. I've already got my developers working on landing pages on my website. So people who go there that don't know Jesus can get saved. We're working on videos this coming week. Just helping people without all this religiosity. Like I've got it. I'm going through a divorce. Help. And they type that in YouTube. And here I can pop up and give them some advice without all the Christianese. And then at the end, I can say, Jesus loves you. Go to this website and learn more. Everything. I'm talking about stadium crusades in the Philippines, possibly also in Indonesia. Soul, 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 souls. Here at Awakening House of Prayer on the discipleship front, we're going to begin to have a free school of ministry for people that want to be raised up. Learn how to cast out devils. Learn how to, uh, uh, you know, do healing. Learn how to preach. Learn how to teach children. Learn how to do all these things that make a church run so that we're effective. So when we go out on the streets, we can do the gospel. We can do the, the ministry. We need to be like the sons of Issachar, having understanding of the times in our life and in the world around us. And I believe, you know, Dutch Sheets just prophesied I don't know if you know Dutch, but he just prophesied that the billion soul harvest is imminent. The billion soul harvest is what Bob Jones prophesied about before he died. And the billion soul harvest would be the last great harvest, most likely, before the Lord's return. That doesn't mean he's going to come back immediately after the harvest, but that's going to be like the last mega wave is what's been prophesied. And I would tend to believe it. The signs of the times are all around us. Matthew 16, verses 2 and 3. Jesus answered them, when it is evening, you say, it will be fair weather, for the sky is red, and in the morning, it will be foul weather today, for the sky is red and overcast. Oh, you hypocrites, you can discern the face of the sky, but you cannot discern the kairos. The devils also know their kairos time. That's why the warfare against you is so intense, because they know their time is almost up. They know the markers in the spirit. They know the Lord Jesus Christ is getting closer to his return. And I don't know when he'll come back, but I know we're a day closer than we were yesterday. And we need to have an urgency in our heart to win the lost and to make disciples. This is what the apostles in the New Testament did. They just didn't build big mega churches and have webinars and have big conferences with celebrities. I'm not against that per se. But dear God, the apostles of the New Testament went around preaching the gospel. There's more than one Kairos time in your life. Aren't you glad? There's a lot of scripture. So if you miss one, if you miss one, and I've missed one before, I've missed a Kairos time. But now I'm smarter and I'm wiser and I know what to do. And I'm not going to read you all these scriptures with Kairos for sake of time. But I am going to talk to you. I'm going to bring it back down to you now personally. All of it's really personal because it's the gospel. But I'm going to bring it down to you personally. How to discern and how to respond in the midst of a Kairos time. There's a few practical keys that are going to help you. 
Kairos time is the opportune time. It's the favorable time. It's the sweet spot. It's where everything goes right. Doesn't mean there's no warfare, but it means that this is it. This is that moment that you've been waiting for, and you've got to step into it. You don't want to miss it, number one. When the Kairos time is approaching, you're going to feel a rumbling many times in your life. Ask the Holy Spirit, what's going on? I have felt a rumbling for the past two years. I left Charisma Magazine, and I still felt the rumble. I've known very strongly for the past... 14 months that there needs to be some changes, but I did not know what they were. And when you know they're, they're need, you need to make changes, but you don't know what they are, you can't just go making changes hoping you get it right because you could get rid of something that you need. So when you don't know what to do, wait until you do. Don't just start cutting stuff off. But I've been sensing this rumbling, and God was building up to this movement, this moment of greater focus on souls and discipleships. And, you know, I've always said, you've, if you've been around me a lot, you'll hear me say it, evangelism is my weakest grace. I can build, I can prophesy, I can teach, I can pastor, but the evangelism part has never been my strongest suit. I can preach the gospel, I can go knock on doors, I've done it, but it's not my strongest suit. And it's just like God, <laughs> To take someone who is not their strongest suit and saying, this is your new suit. You're going to wear this mantle now. And I'm not an evangelist, but the Bible says do the work of an evangelist. Amen. We're all called to preach the gospel. All of us, every single one of us are called to share Christ. You know, Mike Bickle said something to me once a long time ago. He said, if you want to be effective in ministry, how many of you want to be effective in ministry? He said, if you want to be effective in ministry, find out what the Lord is doing in any generation and get on board with that. Because we like to do our thing. We like to do it our way. We want God to bless that. But that's not the way it should be. We should find out what he's doing in any given season, in any given generation, and get on board with it. And that is what I am doing. And that's what you should do too. Number two, think back to the prayers that you've prayed in past seasons. Are your prayers coming to pass in a different way than you imagined? Sometimes we pray and then God answers, but it doesn't look, the answer doesn't look like what we prayed for or what we thought we'd see in result of the prayer. But it's him. It's him. All of this, all of this is happening in my ministry. And all of this, all of it, all of it is because of things I've prayed. God can do whatever he wants. He's sovereign. But most of the time, he chooses to work through prayers. And sometimes I believe we're praying in the spirit, and we don't know what we're praying. And I imagine I was praying, Lord, give me a heart for souls. Lord, put a burden on me for souls. God, I just got to have a hunger and a thirst to see people saved. I believe I was praying that in the spirit because I wouldn't have prayed it in the natural. I was praying things like, Lord, you know, make me more prophetic. Lord, give me a grace to build. I was praying in line with what my gift mix was. And there's nothing wrong with that. I would pray for souls for them to get saved, but I wasn't praying, Lord, make me an evangelist. Put me in stadium crusades. Give me a heart for the lost. I should have been, and so should you. Can we be real today? Yes. Number three, prepare for, the, for your promise. Prepare for it. What if the Kairos moment showed up right now and you weren't ready? You would not be fully prepared to step into the fullness of what God has for you. You'd get part of it. What if you were prepared? What are you doing right now spiritually to prepare for that which you've dreamed of, that moment, that opportunity that you've been waiting for? What are you doing financially? Are you sowing now? What are you doing relationally? Are you cultivating relationships with people that will help you and that you can help? You know, before I went into full-time ministry, I, 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 made it a, 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 I made sure I was out of debt because I didn't want to be dependent on the church or anybody else. I wanted to be financially free because the reason why you see so many ministers, you know, pounding people for money all the time is because they, they don't have any money and they're not trusting God for it. So they have to manipulate and do all these weird anointing oil sales on TBN and on whatever. <laughs> You've seen it, right? Or how about the, the dust from the old revivals or the miracle soap? 
They manufacture all this to merchandise you because they're not trusting God. And they've got a big, look, we have a big budget, but I have to trust God for it. I ask you to sow. I ask you to give because it's the right thing to do for, you know, for us to, but I don't beat people down for that because I'm, I don't need to, I, I trust God and I'm debt free. Number four, dig out prophetic words, dig out the prophetic words that have been spoken over your life. What prophetic words may point to what you've since may be happening now? That's why you got to write these things down. What prophetic words point to it? And I was looking in January, January 5th, we had come back from IHOP. I had a few days to rest. And I was looking back at the prophetic words that Bishop Hammond and Jane Hammond and just very different random people had spoken over my life. And I was just reviewing them. And in that moment... And I found this too. I've forgotten about it. This is how fast you forget about prophetic words. On January the 5th, Apostle Jonathan Stidham, my spiritual son, sent me a text. And I had already forgotten about it. I wrote it down. I recorded it. I put it in my prophetic words file. But the text said, I, he sent me a picture of a stadium with all these people. And he says, I saw you preaching the gospel in a stadium. And the Lord says that there is not a nation in the earth that he will not open to you if you ask him for it. Psalm 1 says, ask me of the nations, ask me for the nations, ask me for the heathen. And, 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 and that was like the prelude. That was just six weeks before this whole shift happened. God will always give you markers. Think to the prayers you prayed. Think to the prophetic words that you had. Review them. Number five, stay alert, watch, and pray. Stay alert, watch, and pray. Because you can miss a Kairos moment. If you're not spiritually minded, if you're so busy with life, you'll just miss it. It'll just, and then you're jealous. Well, how come everybody else got their Kairos moment and I didn't get mine? <laughs> Yours came, beloved. You are too busy. Or you just didn't discern it because you hadn't been taught. But you're learning today. Amen. You're learning today. You got to be spiritual alert. All of this started. All of this happened. All of this, all of this, the Lord orders your steps, right? Is that what the Bible says? The Lord orders your step. All of this happened in this time because of an email that came into our ministry from a woman in Singapore. And we get a thousand emails a week at least, probably more. So we can't even answer them all. You just have to kind of go through them and see, is this an emergency? You just can't even, there's no way we don't have the bandwidth to respond and counsel the world. And so this one came in and Prophet Vanessa checks this particular email address and it came in and she read it. And it was about this woman. She said, my father, he just passed away and we're trying to, you know, really build, go on with his vision to build these businesses. But, you know, it's, there's just been so many attacks and she sends it. She says, this lady, you might want to look at this one. And, you know, partly because it was Singapore. And I know that I have a, a portion in Singapore. So she sends it to me and I looked up the woman and she's like a real lady, like a businesswoman, not like, you know, you know, somebody that's just distraught and writing every single ministry in the world for help. Some people do that and you can't, you can't. You want to help everybody. You provide resources and videos and articles and books and these things to help them, but you can't one-on-one -on -one with everybody. So she sends me this video and thank God she was checking the email. And thank God that she was spiritually alert enough. She sent it to me. I said, this woman's the real deal. I said, tell her we're coming to Singapore in a couple of months. And that if she's available, you know, we'll have coffee or dinner or something. And it was this woman who took us to the dinner with her billionaire brother who prophesied over me, who got me into this mega church in Indonesia where my whole life shifted. You see how the Lord orders your steps? But you also see how easy it is to miss it. If she hadn't saw the email and been spiritually discerning enough to say this one's different, and if I had not been spiritually discerning enough to see something was there, and if we didn't go meet her, because I was under, remember, massive warfare. I didn't want to meet anybody, but I knew that I had to. You were laughing because you've been that way before? Stay in my cave. Leave me alone. I'm staying in my cave. I'm not coming out. Some people should be in church right now and they're in a cave somewhere when this is the message they needed to hear to set themselves free. Once you've, number six, once you've discerned that it's your Kairos time, quickly get into agreement with God. Quickly. Don't resist them because it doesn't look like your suit of clothes. Don't resist them because it's not what you thought it was going to look like. 
Don't resist them because it doesn't make sense to your mind because nothing, barely anything ever the Lord asked me to do makes sense to my mind, at least not at first. You know, when you say quit Charisma Magazine and go into full-time ministry, I'm like, why would I do that? I'm making six figures a year and I like media. Why would I do that? Why would I do that? Why would I do But I did it. And now I'm, I'm over in nations of the earth and now we're going to do global evangelism. Number seven, surrender your will to the Lord and hold on. Surrender your will to the Lord completely and hold on. And, you know, I'm a big fan, if you want to call it that, of Catherine Kuhlman. And she's gone on to be with the Lord, obviously. She was a miracle worker. She was a redhead, so we have a special bond, you know. <laughs> special anointing, you know. And, but she, I, I was, used to watch her videos just ad nauseum. And she said one day she got to the end of the road and... She'd just been through a divorce. She married a man that God told her not to marry. She married him anyway. And she didn't feel any more qualified to do anything for the Lord. And she said, Lord, she said, if there's anything in me that you can use for your glory, here I am. Send me. And it's prayers like that that I've prayed that I think have put me in positions that I'm in. And it's not always easy and many times I get weary, and sometimes I want to quit, but I never do. And you won't either. And I want to encourage you today, don't quit when it gets tough. Don't give up when it looks like all is lost, because all is not lost. You have Jesus. You're filled with the Spirit. You have his word. You have his name. You're a citizen in heaven. Your eternity is secure. This is all just a blip on the radar screen, and we've got to be about our Father's business, and we've got to get stable enough in our own minds that we can go be a witness, a living epistle to somebody else. We've got to grow up in God so that the people around and about us don't see us as religious hypocrites and don't see us as basket cases who can never possibly help them. We've got to do what God is calling us to do. I don't know when Jesus is coming back. It might not be for 2,000 years, but I think it could be sooner than we think. And I, we have to live with an urgency. How many of you have lost loved ones? Well, there you go. You go minister the gospel to somebody else's family, and God will send somebody to your family. I want to encourage you. You can do this. Whatever it is you're going through, however hard it's been in the past, God will make it up to you. He will redeem the time for you. There is a Kairos moment for you, and you are well ready to step into it. Take this lesson. Watch it again if you can. I want you to see, to see all success, and I want to see all all your dreams come true. And I want to see you debt free. And I want to see your bodies healed. I want to see you with none of these natural problems, or at least not enough to keep you from doing the greater work, which is really the gospel. Hallelujah. Somebody shout amen. God is good.